Having established that some LEDs do emit light, the next thing to talk about is how efficiently they do that. There are some mechanisms that limit the performance of an LED. You put in a certain amount of energy and you get less energy in the form of light coming out. There are several processes, but we're going to talk about three of them. First, having to do with the quantum mechanics of recombination. There are other ways for recombination to resolve its energy than to emit a photon. And so not every time an electron and a hole recombine do they produce a photon. Sometimes they excite a phonon, that is they excite a lattice vibration instead of sending out a photon. Now that is thermal energy. There are other things than light that can, can be produced. But for direct gap semiconductors, that efficiency is much better. For indirect gap semiconductors, that efficiency of, is much lower. So eta sub rad, eta is the Greek letter that we use for efficiency. Then there's extraction efficiency, which relates to how many of those photons that do get generated actually make it out of the semiconductor. Uh, they, can, they can be lost in certain ways. They can be reflected at the surfaces. They can leak out the sides. I think be reabsorbed in the material. That electrode that inevitably ends up on the output surface could block what it does. It's, a, it's an obscuration for some of the photons. And so that's your ATIS of EXTR, the extraction uh, efficiency. And then finally, there's the current efficiency, meaning you're biasing the, the diode. So you're sending some current through it. But not all of the electrons that go in come out as photons. The extraction efficiency is a measure of how many of the electrons that enter the semiconducting diode as you know, charge carriers actually interact as they go through the junction in order to make an uh, electron hole pair and generate a photon. Those are three leading factors of inefficiency in LEDs, and they can all be present. They're all numbers between 0 and 1 because they're efficiencies. And you know, if you have multiple inefficiencies, the total efficiency is the product of all of those efficiencies. So you can just multiply them together to get the total efficiency. I indicate these two, the radiation efficiency and the current efficiency, as internal efficiencies, whereas extraction efficiency really has to do with how the semiconducting die has been prepared. That's really not an internal thing. But uh, the internal efficiencies have to do with the quantum mechanical interactions going on inside the semiconductor. So you call them quantum efficiencies. Efficiency is defined as what you want out divided by what you have to put in. What you want out is a certain number of emitted photons. What goes in is a certain number of charge carriers. And that ratio serves well as the efficiency of a semiconductor. So if I tell you that for every three electrons that goes into the semiconductor diode, one photon comes out, then that tells you the efficiency is one-third. That's, that's what we mean by it. So let's do a little problem here. I'll, I'll let you read it. So it's green. So we know it's wavelength. Uh, we know that 10 milliamps is going in. That tells you how many electrons per second, that's how many carriers per second are entering the PN junction. We know the energy of each photon that comes out, but that doesn't answer the question, what's the emitted optical power, which is joules per second coming out of the semiconductor, coming out of the uh, PN junction. To figure that out, we have to take what we're given and turn that into output joules per second. Can you figure out what's going in? And how many charge carriers are going in, perhaps, is something we can figure out. Do you see an efficiency stated here? Given that efficiency, we can figure out how many photons are coming out, and we know the energy of each photon, so then we can find out the power coming out. So let's do that. Let's calculate these three quantities. First, the photons. That's the easiest thing to get out of the way, the energy of each photon. So let's do that first. So this 562 nanometers. Now all you have to do to get the energy of each photon is Hc divided by lambda. So 1240 over 562 gives you 2.2 electron volts. On average means that there's a width to the distribution. Not all of the photons that come out have a wavelength of exactly 562 nanometers. They're distributed around that average. That's each photon's energy. How many electrons are going in each second? That's the next question. So you're given 10 milliamps. Can you convert that into electrons per second? Well, sure, because amps is the coulombs per second, and you know how many coulombs goes with each electron, so you can find out how many electrons go in each second, right? You just take the 10 milliamps, 
10 to the minus 2 coulombs per second and divide out the charge of an electron. 6.2 times 10 to the 16th electrons go into the PN junction every second. So now to get the power coming out, we know how many electrons go in. So do you know how many photons come out? Each uh, three electrons produces one photon. So take that 6.2 and divide by 3. And you have the number of photons being emitted times 10 to the 16th each second. Do you know the energy of each photon? 2.2 electron volts. We need watts, and so you have to do something with that 2.2 electron volts. You have to convert it to joules. So convert it to joules. That's the first step in this solution. 2.2 electron volts converted to joules. And then you have to take the number of electrons that went in each second, 6.2 times 10 to the 16th, and multiply by a third, because that's the efficiency. One photon comes out for every three electrons. And you get 7.2 milliwatts. That's the output power. An illustration, I guess, of using, using quantum efficiency or, or overall efficiency. We weren't told how the 1 and 3 was figured out. We're just told that that's what eta equals. Now I want to change subjects a little bit, shift gears. Not, not a huge change of subject. We're still on optoelectronics, electronics, but I want to go from talking about LEDs to talking about how photons and atoms interact with each other or the bigger question of how electromagnetic radiation and matter interact. A photon strikes an atom and what happens? I mean, you, you know, you can put an electron in an excited state, right? Then the photon is absorbed. And other things can happen. There are three things I need to tell you about for uh, interaction between electromagnetic radiation and matter. By electromagnetic radiation, I mean a photon. And by matter, I could mean an atom, or I could mean a semiconducting band structure. You'll see that right now. So here's one example. Spontaneous emission happens when you have two states available. So this could be the ground state of an atom, E1, and E2 could be the excited state of an atom. Or E1 could be the valence band edge of a semiconductor, and E2 is the conduction band edge. Works for both. And you have an electron up at E2, and it goes home to E1. I'll only do that if there's a vacancy for it, but it does that, and out comes a photon. And it's spontaneous emission because there's nothing any external agent did to make that happen. It happened because a lifetime for that excited state was exceeded. <laughs> and, and that just happens. That on average, this transition happens when the lifetime of the excited state is passed. The photons that come out are incoherent. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, so if I have multiple atoms emitting these photons, or just multiple electrons in a conduction band going into valence band, the photons come out without any coherence. In order to really define that, I think I should really tell you what coherence means rather than telling you what incoherence means. So hang on to it for a minute, and we'll come back to what coherence means, and then you the opposite is that. A second thing that can happen is a photon comes along. So in the first case, the photon was generated in this decay. But here, a photon comes along from the outside. It hits an electron that's in the ground state, or the valence band, and it jumps up to a vacancy in the excited state, or the conduction band. And then you wait a little while, and the electron returns to the vacancy, emitting a photon. The photon that comes out will have the exact same energy as the photon that went in, because the electron was up there with the energy that it received from that photon. And when an electron receives energy from a photon, it receives all of it. Not part of it, all of it. That second process is spontaneous emission. The first process is called resonant absorption. Resonant because you have a energy gap here. That just happens to equal the energy of that photon. And that's the only case in which this works. The photon is resonating with the atom or the semiconductor. The third process is a little less expected. In this case, you already have an electron up in the excited state. It may have gotten there through resonant absorption. It may have gotten there, probably got there some other way, actually. It probably got there by an inelastic collision. Along comes a photon now. The electron's already up in the excited state. A photon comes along. You'd say, what can it do? you say, well, nothing. It can't do anything. If the electron's already up there, it can't go higher. There it is. Well, something interesting happens. That photon tickles that electron. 
it, the, the word is perturbs. It perturbs that electron. But I think it's more useful to think of it as tickling it. So you have this electron sitting here. The photon comes along and tickles it. It starts giggling back and forth. And it might giggle with such an amplitude that it can find the ground state. And down it goes. If that happens, you have one photon coming in. It can't be absorbed because that electron is going down. It's not going up higher. And so that photon has to keep coming out. But a new photon also comes out because that transition happened. And two photons come out. And to be honest, I don't think there's any way to actually say that this photon that came in is the exact same photon as one of the two that comes out. Uh, it, it happens too fast. For our purposes, it is. It's one of them. These two photons that come out are coherent with the photon that came in. That is, they're in phase. They're in phase with each other. They're in phase with it. They have the same polarization. What that means is that the photon that came in had its electric field pointing in uh, to the left. <laughs> then these two photons will have their electric field vector pointing to the left. Finally, they're going in the same direction. When those conditions are met, you say that those photons are coherent. And then these two photons run into another atom each. So you have four photons. And they're still coherent because that second collision happens really fast. Get this avalanche of coherent photons coming out of the material. That's a laser. So that's the principle that we'll talk about when we get to semiconducting diode lasers in a little bit here. We'll, we will be using stimulated emission as a theoretical background for this device. And we'll get to that shortly.